the intersection of climate change, biodiversity loss, and global frictions, new challenges for Africa's <coughs> archaeologists. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences and Professor Wang Wei and all the organizers of the Fourth Shanghai Archaeology Forum for their kind uh, invitation to present today. I'd also like to thank you all uh, in the audience for, for being here after lunch and hopefully for listening. So I begin this talk with the consideration of two images taken a week, and a, a week apart this year. The one on the left showing flooded fields in Somalia in late November, and the one on the right showing Victoria Falls on the Zimbabwe-Zambia border in early December. The recent heavy rains in East Africa extending across Somalia, Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Kenya have been catastrophic for farmers, destroying harvests and settlements and bringing waterborne diseases in their wake. At the same time, the severe drought afflicting Southern Africa has also impacted farmers and herders, resulting in crop failure and the death of many uh, livestock and wildlife, and severe, creating severe shortages of clean wa drinking water for local populations. Two different sets of climate-related events, yet with rather similar consequences, especially for small-scale farmers and other rural dwellers. It is well documented that floods and droughts and other climate disasters have impacted societies across Africa many times in the past, and that the weather systems in eastern and southern Africa can result in cycles of opposing extremes. When rainfall is below average in eastern Africa and threatens droughts, rainfall in southern Africa is typically higher than annual averages and precipitates floods and vice versa as we're seeing this year. What does seem to be changing based on the available observational records for the last century is the frequency and severity of these events and the increased unpredictability of regional weather systems as a whole. While many caveats need to be considered these changes and the ongoing climate-related disasters in southern and eastern Africa can be considered to be symptomatic of wider changes that several scholars associate with a new global epoch, the Anthropocene. While debate continues as to both when the Anthropocene began and even whether the concept had any real empirical basis, there has been growing interest within archaeology over the last two decades with what the implications of the Anthropocene might mean for the discipline. And from this have emerged three broad approaches, although there is often overlap between them. Archaeology in, of, and for the Anthropocene. The first of these focuses very much on the threats posed by ongoing climate change to archaeological and other heritage resources. The loss of potential that may, uh, the, the loss of potential information that may arise and how to mitigate against such threats. Such approaches can be characterized as archaeology in the Anthropocene. And this slide here depicts recent resurvey of the site of Lothigam on the shores of Lake Takana northern Kenya that was led by Stephen Goldstein uh, from the Max Planck's Planck Institute in Jena recently. Lothigam, originally excavated in the 1960s, has yielded large faunal, lithic and barb point uh, collections, making it the type site for fisher hunter-gatherers in eastern Africa during the African humid period, roughly between 12,000 and 6,000 years ago. And the increased rainfall during this period fed the expansion of rivers, grasslands, and mega lakes across much of northern and eastern Africa. And the fisher forager societies who thrived during this period eventually would have been forced to radically alter their lifeways as climates rapidly shifted towards extreme aridity um, after about 6,000 years ago. Um, and the Lothigam site is crucial to understand this, understanding this tradition 
but as Goldstein's survey show, its archaeological record is now severely threatened by current climate change. The second approach has deeper intellectual roots in the discipline and is an extension of established traditions of environmental archaeology, but with a much more explicit focus on how people and societies in the past have faced the challenges presented by previous periods of significant climate change. In some cases, these studies restrict themselves to events and responses in the past. The signif a significant aspect A significant aspect of such research has been the demonstration of the great antiquity of unintended human impacts on their environments, prompting several scholars to argue that the Anthropocene began not with the inception of the nuclear era, nor even with the beginnings of industrialization in the West, but with the origins of agriculture and livestock domestication. We might describe such studies as being archaeologies of the Anthropocene. And this slide, slide is a synopsis of the deep history of an area of the tropical rainforest belt in Central Africa, as reconstructed through interdisciplinary research by a team of Belgian, French, and Congolese researchers led by Professor Marin Rivat from the University of Liège. The results show that the populations of light demanding trees that dominate the canopy of Central African forests are now aging. Also, that the lack of regeneration of these populations began quite recently, about 165 years ago, after major anthropogenic disturbances ceased. Previously, in fact, local populations formally gardened the forest by creating scattered openings, which were sufficiently large enough for the establishment of light demanding trees. Since 1885, however, less mobility and disturbance in the forest has occurred because the colonial administrations concentrated people and villages along the primary communication axis. So in other words, human activity was a critical component of the forest ecosystem in the past. And current common logging, uh, logging operations do not create suitable openings for the regeneration of these species whereas deforest and, and is in resulting in degradation of the forest itself. The third form of research, archaeology for the Anthropocene, is much more applied in focus and often aims at demonstrating how archaeological and related knowledge of past human environment relations can be used to inform the present and assist planning for more sustainable futures, especially ones we're in line with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Here I summarize some of the ways this can be done. And the following slides offer examples of relevant case studies. A key point I think is that archeological research with its unique perspective on the history of human activity on earth and its consequences provides a means to establish how sustainable certain activities really are and over what temporal and spatial scales. This slide refers to some of the recent work by Dr. Darrell Stump and his team at the University of York in the UK in collaboration with various partners in Africa on the deep history of intensive agriculture in Africa. This and related work challenges the mistaken view that arose during the colonial period and has continued in certain policy circles ever since into the present. That, and this was that African farming practices were rarely capable of intensifying agricultural production and hence the need to be shown how to do this by foreign experts. And also that when they did attempt it, an intensification, this was not sustainable over the long term. Dr. Stump's research has focused on both abandoned systems and ones that are still in operation. Most of the archaeological research has been undertaken at Engaruka in northern Tanzania. And this is the largest abandoned irrigated system of irrigated agricultural fields and terraces in sub-Saharan -Sub Africa, coming, covering some 20 square kilometers. The results of that project indicate that Engaruka's farmers were highly skilled landscape engineers and agricultural managers 
who developed a systematic means to capture the sediment carried by permanent and seasonal rivers so as to deposit this across a large area, creating fertile fields in an area that is other, otherwise characterized by low nutrient soils and low mean rainfall. And the system operated for over 400 years, and Engaruka's population was likely exchanging surplus produce with communities up to 200 kilometers away, suggested by other archaeological data. Its economy was both vibrant and seemingly su sustainable. The system ended as a consequence of wider changes in the regional political ecology that coincided with a period of regional declines in rainfall. It did not collapse. Instead, it transformed into a system of livestock herding better adapted to these new conditions. This slide summarizes work undertaken over a number of decades by Professor Anne Stahl, University of Victoria, and Dr. Amanda Logan, Northwestern University. And this research undertaken in the Banda district of West Central Ghana. Now today, uh, July is the hungry season in this area. People survive on cassava, cooking a polenta-like pollage, and they stir the leaves into a soup. But often there isn't enough to go round. And the meal also typically lacks protein. And it's easy to think that life has always been this way in Banda, a poor, mostly agricultural district. Yet Anne Stahl and Amanda Logan's research has shown that before the mid 19th century, people, people here usually had enough to eat, even when rains failed. And from the 11th to 15th centuries, people mostly ate uh, pearl millet. Now in the middle of the 15th century, a two century long drought set in, and this is documented in the ecological records from the nearby Lake uh, Basumtu. And there was no big, but we see no big increase in wild plants uh, in the archaeobotanical assemblages. Now, wild plants are what people today typically uh, uh, eat to get through famines. There was also no shift in less pre preferable foods and no major declines in population. People kept eating millet. And the archaeological evidence indicates that a wide range of iron, copper, ceramic, ivory, and cloth are. Uh, were being produced and trade and craft production were still thriving even during these periods of extreme climatic hardship. It was really only until the slave trade siphoned off many farmers and artisans and Banda was incorporated into Britain's Gold Coast colony in the late 1800s that these resilient systems were undercut and farming became less sustainable. For my own research over the last two decades, I focused on developing a landscape historic ecology perspective at different spatial and temporal scales aimed at integration of multiple kinds of data, but also incorporating various theoretical frames, including notions of assemblage, entanglement, and the effective power of objects, as well as resilience theory. The overarching goal has been to draw out the implications of taking a long-term by which I mean centennial or longer timescales, perspective for understanding contemporary challenges and planning for the future. Recent projects have included historicizing models of, eco of the ecological consequences of pastoral settlements on East African semi-arid savannas. It has been recognized by ecologists for over a decade that abandoned pastoral settlements act as nutrient hotspots that help promote biodiversity through relations of ecological mutualism at multiple trophic scales. The question has remained, however, as to how long such hotspots contribute to sustaining local ecological biodiversity. And our research on the Lycipio Plateau suggests abandoned pastoralist settlements survive as open grazing lawns for up to 600 years, as at that's seen here at the site of Mugi. This, of course, has implications for how national parks that were created in the colonial period involving the forced resettlement of pastoralists from these areas and their removal um, are managed. Perhaps it is better 
and more beneficial for the wildlife to put the pastures back into those parks. Our research has also identified a tradition of large pastoral sites of congregation and assemblage that are at least three times bigger in extent than any pastoral site documented ethnographically or historically. Given the similarities between sites such as Mugi occupied in the 15th century and those like Miley Sita occupied in the 18th century, this tradition lasted several hundreds of years but seems to have been abandoned in the early 19th century after a major regional drought lasting upwards of 30 years. One consequence of this drought was significant reconfiguration and reconstruction of pastoralist economies and social organization, giving rise to the forms of pastoralist society well documented in the ethnographic record. Such data then calls into question the use of contemporary and ethno-historic uh, records of pastoralist societies as direct analogies for understanding earlier uh, pre-colonial uh, pastoralist systems in East Africa. They have changed quite considerably. <coughs> Other research uh, undertaken over the last decade or so uh, began with an investigation of the 19th century trade in elephant ivory and its consequences for local economies, societies and environments as an example of globalization in the early industrial era. Our geographical focus was on the caravan halts along the Pangani Valley and contemporary settlement in the adjacent uplands, such as the Pare Mountains, which are known today as a biodiversity hotspot with high species endemism. Four research questions explored uh, through a, an, a program of integrated landscape analysis in the Pare Mountains were whether agricultural, agricultural production was intensified in the 19th century to meet the demands of passing caravans, numbering between 500 and 2,000 porters for food supplies, as several historians have argued. We also wanted to determine empirically whether this intensification and inferred increased vegetation clearance in an upland area with high an annual rainfall initiated the severe erosion that can be seen along the foothills today, as, ha as has been suggested since Europeans first reached the area. In the end, combined paleoecological, geoarchological and archaeological research indicated a far more complex and less linear environmental history, with pulses of vegetation clearance, recovery and conservation that did not always align with phases of soil erosion and soil formation and cannot easily be matched with the archaeological evidence for resource utilization and crop production. One particular environmental narrative we examined was whether increased iron production, for which the Pare are renowned in many regional oral histories, um, and as a consequence of the demand for charcoal for that iron production, was a particularly important driver of environmental degradation, especially as this narrative has resurfaced in recent environmental management policy. Again, the archaeological, paleontological, and archaeometallurgical results point to a more complex story including a shift from lowland settings to upland settings for iron production, with, which possibly allowed vegetation recovery on the, lower slates, on the lower slopes. Preliminary charcoal analyses and ethno-historical data also indicate that only a few species of trees were used for making charcoal, which might also suggest that charcoal production alone did not result in widespread deforestation. Analysis of colonial historical archives and historic remote sensing imagery, coupled with oral histories and anthropological research, has also shown that the popular narrative of continuing deforestation in this area is incorrect. There has been more trees in the last uh, century than, in the, uh, than uh, say, in the 1920s. 
Yet even in developing this critique, it also became clear that while there has been a trend towards re reforestation since the mid 20th century, because a lot of replanting has been single species and have introduced alien species such as wattle and eucalyptus, there has not necessarily been an overall improvement in either biodiversity or general ecological resilience. Summing up, I'd like to offer a few reflections on the challenges of research aimed at integrating deep history perspectives into planning for more sustainable futures. Also, I'd like to note that in tandem with these academic challenges, we need to reflect on the rapid pace of urban and infrastructure development across sub-Saharan Africa, much of which is funded through loans and other mechanisms uh, from the Chinese government, among other countries. At the 2018 meeting of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, President Xi Jinping stated that China aspired to be Africa's good friend, good partner, and good brother. And as a sign of this, pledged uh, 60 billion US dollars in new credit lines and aid. While the numerous infrastructure projects in Africa currently supported by China are contributing to the continent's economic growth and improving livelihood prospects, very few of them have involved any form of archaeological impact assessment work or salvage excavations. <coughs> the small number of professional archaeologists in many sub-Saharan countries and the absence in some of these of appropriate legislation add to the challenges of documenting sites threatened by development activities and ongoing globalization. Clearly, <coughs> the deep time information that I have pointed to you that can provide information of planning for sustainable futures is very much on threat for, from this uh, construction and development work. So I'd like to end by appealing to our Chinese <coughs> colleagues here to be good friends, partners, brothers, ancestors by starting a conversation, excuse me, by starting a conversation with Africa's archaeologists about how best to resolve the challenges of implementing impact assessments and mitigation work uh, in conjunction with the projects that China is now funding, the infrastructure projects that China is now funding, um, and to resolve challenges and assist them in undertaking high quality salvage archaeology, for which China is justly world renowned, excuse me, justly world renowned on the, Africa, uh, on the global stage. And to help facilitate this conversation, I'd like to extend an open invitation to put any of you who, here from China to participate in a one day meeting to be held in Oxford next September in advance of the Biennial Society of Africanist Archaeologists, uh, uh, contact me. My email's there. Thank you for listening.